a person who thinks all the time has nothing to think about except thought. So, he loses touch with reality and lives in a world of illusion. By thought, I mean specifically chatter in the skull, perpetual and compulsive repetition of words, of reckoning and calculating. I'm not saying that thinking is bad. Like everything else, it's useful in moderation. A good servant, but a bad master. And all so-called civilized people have increasingly become crazy and self-destructive because through excessive thinking they have lost touch with reality. That's to say, we confuse signs, words, numbers, symbols, and ideas with the real world. Most of us would have rather money than tangible wealth, and a great occasion is somehow spoiled for us unless photographed. And to read about it the next day in the newspaper is oddly more fun for us than the original event. This is a disaster. For as a result of confusing the real world of nature with mere signs, such as bank balances and contracts, we are destroying nature. We are so tied up in our minds that we've lost our senses. Time to wake up. What is reality? Obviously, no one can say because it isn't words. It isn't material, that's just an idea. It isn't spiritual, that's also an idea, a symbol. Reality is this. Realize that anybody whom you consider in matters spiritual, psychological, and so on has an authority. Has this authority because of your opinion that he has, or she has? How do you know? If you say, for example, like a Protestant fundamentalist, that you believe in the Bible, that the Bible is inspired. Or you may say, as a more liberal kind of Christian, that Jesus Christ is the greatest being that ever lived on earth. How do you know? It's your opinion that that is so. Lots of people may have told you so, and you may be very impressed by those people, but you bought it. And so, therefore, if you say, well, I would like to become like that, that an expression of the way you are, you couldn't feel I would like to become like that, like the authority, like the Christ, except as an expression of the way you are now. And the way you are now is the quaking man. And therefore, your emulation, your desire, your idealism to become like Christ is merely one of the appetites of your quaking nurse. It's an expression in you as you are. You don't fool yourself. I'm not trying to put you down by talking about the quaking mess. The quaking mess may be, in fact, something very, very natural the way we are, the state of the bad, and we shouldn't be ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed of it. I told you I'm attractive. 
<laughs> but it is important not to fool oneself about this. But there does, doesn't there, seem to remain a problem about existence, about being alive. Now let's go into what is that problem at the sort of nitty-gritty level. Very basic in our thinking is that we, as it say, one must live. We need to survive, to go on. We need, therefore, money for food, for this, that, and the other. We must go on. And we know that we're not going to get away with it for very long. That after a certain number of years, we're going to die. But the, the thing is going to end. The thing that we call I is going to be as it is in sleep. Deep sleep with no dream. But that between now and that hour, there may be the most ghastly pain. Not only perhaps the pains of physical disease, or being wounded, or hurt, but the pains of worrying about our failure of responsibility to people who depend on us. And we suffer other people's suffering simply because we're sensitive in that imagination and participate in their suffering and our adrenaline and our chemical response simply by imagination to the sufferings of other people. And what about that? And so we can look at these problems and say, now, quite obviously, all these problems cannot be solved in a physical way. That is to say, we do not expect in our lifetime that medical skill will make us exempt from death. We do not seriously expect that human beings will all learn to be nice to each other and will refrain from war and horrors of that kind, racial prejudice and so on. We don't seriously expect to find a method of being protected by taking some sort of drug against all possible disease and pain. So therefore we say, now maybe there's another way around. Maybe that instead of solving these problems at the technical level, we could solve them at the psychological and spiritual level by so disciplining ourselves, by so doing something with ourselves, that we wouldn't be afraid of it anymore. And so, in accord with that motivation, we seek out spiritual teachers, psychological teachers, this, that, and the other. Could we somehow be made over so that we don't worry about the breaking mess by a spiritual discipline or whatever. <clears throat> and you see if you examine that, that this wanting to overcome the breaking mess and not have it anymore, that precisely is the breaking The thing that we object to is precisely what we do about overcoming it. In other words, the activity that we employ in overcoming it is the mess that we object to. Do you see that? And it's very important to realize. Then if you do realize it, you raise the question, then what can I do? Well, 
what can I do to transform the quaking mess into the state of mind of the true mystic? Well, if you are the quaking mess, there is obviously nothing you can do to transform yourself into the state of mind which you idealize as that of being a true mystic, the Christ, the saint, or whatever. So, you realize that uh, everything is phony, that uh, all your ideals are simply manifestations of the quaking mess, trying to get away from yourself. And that you are put in the position of it is absolutely necessary for me to be different from the way I am. But there's absolutely nothing I can do about it because being the way I am, I cannot be different from that. Let's say this, but maybe we can put it in different ways. I know that I ought not to be selfish. And I would very much like to be an unselfish person. But the reason why I want to be an unselfish person is that I am very selfish and would far more love myself and respect myself if I were unselfish. <laughs> I know that I ought to love God and uh, whatever. And why do you want to love God? Well, because God is the biggest boss and it's best to be on the side of the big battalion. <laughs> That's really why I want to. In other words, because I'm looking for the safety of my own spiritual skill. So I think I'll love God. Oh, sophisticated saints have known this. St. Paul understood it, St. Augustine understood it, Martin Luther understood it. They didn't know what the hell to do about it. But there was nothing to do about it. And yet, something has to be done. Obviously. But you realize, when you really look into yourself, there's nothing you can do. And this, therefore, is our point of departure. That we here perhaps, perhaps not, mutually realize there is nothing we can do to be anything else than what we are. To feel any other way than what we feel at this moment. And to be then this quaking mess which has the capacity for the horror about what life can do. However, this isn't as much of a blind alley, a cul-de-sac, as it sounds. Because if you discover a blind alley, it tells you something. Watch the flow of water when it crosses over an area of land. And you will see that it puts out fingers. And some of them stop because they come into blind alley. The water doesn't pursue that point. It simply rises. And then it finds a way it can go. But it never uses any effort. It only uses weight. So it takes the line of least resistance and eventually finds the course. Now we will do the same thing. Only we're ashamed of it. But we're going to do it anyway. We think that when we come to a dead end, a blind alley, Oh, I fail. Supposing the water at each place 
where a finger of water stretches out over dry ground and doesn't go any further because the land is too high. The water would have said to itself, I failed. We would say it was neurotic water. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait, and it will find a way. Now, when you find, you see, that there's, there's this predicament that I've been describing, that there's no way of transforming yourself. To become this fearless, joyous, divine being is distinct from the waking man. When is there no way? This is not a gloomy announcement. It is a very, very important communication. Very inside. Because the, like the land is telling the water, this isn't the way to go. There's another way. Try over here. So in the same way, Life is telling you that's not the way to go. It's telling you, the, the, the message underlying this is you cannot transform yourself, is giving you the message that the you that you imagine to be capable of transforming yourself doesn't exist. In other words, an ego, an I, separate from my emotions, my thoughts, my feelings, my experiences, who is supposed to be in control of, cannot control them because it isn't there. And as soon as you understand that, things will be vastly improved. Now, we can go into this. What do you mean by the word I? We're going to make some experiments on a number of different levels. But the ordinary way, what do you mean by the word I? I myself. Your personality, your ego. What is it? Well, first of all, obviously, it's your image of yourself. It's composed of what people have told you about yourself, who you are, how they've reacted to you, and given you an impression that that's the sort of person you are. It's all your education goes into this, the style of life you put on, and so forth. But, you, but it's an image, it's an idea, it's your thought about yourself, and I suppose yourself is in fact not this, but is, to begin with, your total physical organ, your psychological organ, and beyond that, an organism doesn't exist as a, an isolated thing any more than a flower exists without a stalk, without roots, without earth. So in the same way, although we are not stalked on the ground, we are nevertheless inseparable from a huge social context.